Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your co-host for Pilgrim Publications Presents. I want to thank you for taking your time out, you know, the time out of the day to be with us and uh, analyze a topic that uh, I think is very important to the body of Christ. This is uh, part three of a continuing series that we've been doing on the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. And we'll continue that series today and that topic but first, I'd like to introduce my co-host for this program, who's been with us for this entire series, and uh, a special guest that we have here in studio today just for the discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity. But first, let me introduce my co-host, Bob L. Ross. Bob is director of Pilgrim Publications. He's written many books, several books on different topics. Larry, if our uh, viewers have been following us, we're now into the third program, and uh, they will know that uh, we have tried to maintain somewhat of a sequence to this discussion on the Trinity, but the heart and core of it is we're emphasizing the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's God in the flesh. We want to keep that ever before the viewers because that is the foundation of Christianity, that Christ is... Uh, God in the flesh, the Son of God, and through faith in Him we have everlasting life. Whatever we contend for doctrinally or antagonistically toward other groups, uh, theoretically speaking, we do not want to detract from the basic foundational stone upon which the church is built. Upon this rock I will build my church, and this rock is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And however we may differ with others, and however they may conflict with us on theoretical thinking, uh, we want them to know that we are committed to this as the foundation of our hope of salvation. And we hope that they too will share with us in the faith that Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God, Thou art the Christ, and uh, by faith in Him, we have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And uh, our, uh, our special guest for this series, Mark McNeil. Mark, uh, you were a uh, Val Victorian of uh, Texas Bible College in Houston, Texas. That's where it's located. Mm -hmm. right. Now, there is a, uh, they have an interesting belief system at that Bible College. Uh, would you care to expound on that and relate it into the topic today? Well, the Bible college that I went to was uh, is a school connected with the United Pentecostal Church, which is based upon uh, the redefining of the doctrine of God, at least from the standpoint of the Trinitarian, to a modalistic concept, which takes the, uh, the concepts of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as revealed in the Bible and takes them to be modes of God's manifestation rather than essential relationships within the nature of God. That also affects some of their other doctrines, uh, such as their doctrine of water baptism, that uh, it has to be in the formula in the name of Jesus Christ rather than uh, as the Trinitarians have historically held in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's a discussion in and of itself to discuss the scriptural teaching on that. And then they hold being a part of the Pentecostal movement, uh, one of the more extreme of the Pentecostal movement, uh, taking the spirit baptism to be an essential part of salvation. And uh, we've been discussing the, uh, number one, the biblical basis of the doctrine of the Trinity to refute those that um, would deny that or those that are seriously searching for the truth of that. And then secondly, we've spent a considerable amount of time on the historical development of the doctrine of the Trinity, primarily because that's one of the areas that are attacked quite a bit. And so uh, that's what necessitates this type of reply. And I think today we'll have a good time or in this uh, time of responding to some of the objections to the Doctrine of the Trinity. So yeah. I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, thank you so much. And uh, Mark has just brought out the, one of the main things we'll be talking about in this particular program, objections to the Doctrine of the Trinity, which, uh, of course, a lot of it ties into what Bob was saying about the deity of Christ being the core of everything. And, of course, we're going to get into that. First, uh, we're going to get into some charts here. We're going to define, once again, what the Trinity is in a basic, easy way. The creeds of Christendom uh, throughout church history uh, give much more detailed and uh, uh, concise 
uh, well-defined uh, definitions for your benefit if you'd like to check into those. I, I kind of like the Athanasian Creed myself on that one. Uh, but uh, I would like to turn here to a chart. I know Bob's going to have something to say about our diagram, and I think it's some uh, words that need to be said. It's, uh, it'll tie in with the idea that even though we're going to have a diagram here on this chart that uh, kind of outlines the Trinity, it's not meant by any means to coincide with the actual way God I mean, God is infinite, and we're finite. There's no analogy or example that you can come up with that's going to even be close to God. All we can do in our, in our little way is try to come up with some small way that might make it a little easier for people to understand. So you see a little chart here with a, with a diagram. It's just to point out a couple of things, but by no means is it to be taken like, well, this is the way God is or anything. It's just a simple little diagram to outline a couple of points that I particularly wanted to make on, on, on this subject. So now if we can go to our chart, and we'll take a quick look here and see what we can see. We've got the definition of the Trinity. Now, I've just come up with a simple one here. There's some more well-defined, long, concise ones, but this seems to be a nice, a nice, simple way to state it quickly. Within the nature of the one God are three eternally distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, as I was just mentioning, we have this diagram down below. Now, Bob, you were, before we even did this show, you were saying some very good things that I'd like you to bring out for our viewers' sake about diagrams. You were also mentioning points of light there a minute ago, and I'd like you to just uh, say a few things. Well, Larry, you have put a diagram up there, and the reason that uh, we want to comment on this is because in so many books and articles and writings about the Trinity, there is an effort put forth because the human mind is forever trying to express concepts to others that would convey uh, the truth or the thought that the writer is trying to express. And oftentimes we run into diagrams such as this one. Uh, this happens to be a triangle. Now on the front of a book I have here by Cal Beisner, you notice he has uh, three circles here and he's dealing with the three persons in God. And uh, sometimes uh, you have other diagrams that we could go on endlessly here, maybe uh, talking about how men have tried to express the, the Trinity or some concept similar to the Trinity for that matter. But uh, Mr. Bickersteth, in his book on the Trinity, hit the nail on the head. And, and I have the statement here in the book he says, all human illustrations of this great mystery must fail. But nevertheless, despite the fact that all human illustrations fail to represent God, uh, we do struggle and strain and strive to express, after all, we don't even comprehend God in our minds. So any comprehension we have of God is short of the mark. So maybe this would justify our illustrations, which are also short of the mark. But there is one illustration that Bickersteth gives in this book, which I thought was very unique. And you notice that in Beisner's book, he has those colors of those circles. And I want to read you here what Bickersteth says about light. Now, the reason I like this illustration is because of the fact that the Bible does say God is light. It doesn't say God is a triangle, <laughs> and it doesn't say that God is a circle or uh, whatnot, but it does say God is light. And here's something that Bickersteth pointed out in his book about light. The prismatic spectrum, and by that we mean that ray of uh, light that we get in the creation by which we have this thing we call light, which gives us the opportunity to see things. We could not see anything without light. One of the early creations of God was the light. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's such a mystery. Uh, we know what we're talking about when we say light, but we really don't know what we're talking about when we say light because you, you see it out there, but really you can't see it out there. All you see is what is reflecting from the light that falls upon it. And, uh, but what this is is a 
spectrum of light ray that comes upon the objects and it consists in three spectra of nearly equal length, each of uniform color, superimposed one upon another, and that the colors which the actual spectrum exhibits arise from the mixture of the uniform colors of these three spectra superimposed. Now, all printers and all photographers and workers in uh, those creative fields of uh, books and magazines and whatnot, they know what I'm talking about here. We're talking about the magenta, or the red, as some might call it, and the yellow, and the cyan, or the blue, as uh, it might be called, as in the printing trade. Now, these three things, when you take a picture in full color and you want to reproduce that picture, how do you do it? Well, you've got to separate those three colors, the magenta, the yellow, and the cyan, the red, the yellow, and the blue. So you take it down to a color uh, company. Uh, well, that, that's not necessarily the name of it. I deal with one in Houston called the Color Company. And uh, they will take that, and through the cameras which they use, the instruments that they use, they will filter out each of the other colors, and they'll make a separate film of the magenta and the yellow and the blue. Now, when that printer takes it, he will put those down one at a time, one on top of the other, and when it comes out, you've reproduced in printing the living color. Now... What he is talking about here, these three rays of light, when you combine these three constituent lights, you get pure white light. Pure white light. Now, this is an illustration of what we're talking about when we say we struggle to illustrate God and the Trinity. If God is light, and there are three rays that you kind of sort out of light, red, yellow, and blue. We can observe each of those colors by and of itself. It's still light. It's still light. And then we can push them back together, and it's one pure white light. We don't see any one of the other colors now. We don't see the blue. We don't see the red. We don't see the yellow. Now, all human illustrations fail as we have admitted. But let us just think for a minute about this. We isolate out the red, and we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps. We isolate out the blue, and we look at God the Father. And we isolate out the yellow, and we look at the Holy Spirit. And then we put them all blended together in one. We have the one pure white light of the one God. Now, that is a human effort, and yet God is light. He compares himself to that which is divisible this way just for the sake of observation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to admit that this we cannot reproduce God in illustrations, but we're not going to say that uh, we cannot learn something because Jesus himself used parables in illustrating the Word of God and in illustrating spiritual truths and eternal truths and vital truths. And uh, as Spurgeon said, you can never make a parable stand on four legs. It can never be perfect. So we don't claim these things to be perfection. And when, when someone comes along and he begins to knock us for this and criticize this and say, oh, well, they make the Trinity in the form of... Uh, a created image or something like that. They are completely distorting and misrepresenting the truth. We are not any more doing that than when Jesus took a parable and illustrated something that pertained to God when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. How many how many things in the Bible is Jesus compared to that are finite? A oh, vine? Yeah. Right. A door. Uh, a door. And, uh, over and over you know, and just life. someone wrote a book on it one time. Mm -hmm. Just how many symbols there are in the right. Bible. Uh, a root out of dry ground, the, the rose, the lily, 
and uh, on and on and on. The line, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're doing no injustice to the scripture or violation of the scripture by showing some kind of a simple design to emphasize a principle, and that principle is a three and yet a oneness. That's right. A three and yet a oneness, and, and that's what those anti-Trinitarians don't really like to admit. They like to charge us with believing tritheism or three gods. Mm -hmm. They do not like to admit that we do not really adhere to the well, three god idea. They're always accusing us of believing right. in three gods, but never right. getting it a valid, making a valid point out of it since Trinitarians deny polytheism. They believe only in monotheism, the one true God who manifests himself is three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, with that said, let's go back to this chart now, as Bob so, I think, brilliantly illustrated, with a, uh, you know, not that it's perfect <laughs> illustration, as we said, and neither is this. And all I wanted to show by this chart is what we have here is the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son. But as you can see by these lines, we're saying that the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and vice versa. So we're denying Sabellianism, where Jesus is just manifesting himself as a Father, or the Holy Spirit is really the Son, or something like this. We're denying that in this, this little diagram. We're, we're definitely saying that the Father is distinct from the Son, the Father is distinct from the Holy Spirit, and likewise with the other two persons of the Godhead. What we are saying is the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, like yellow, like red, and like blue, they make the one bright light, as Bob was talking about in this, in this little diagram. And then to go to the scripture verse here, we have Matthew 28, 19, says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You could also go to like 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You have all three members of the Godhead being mentioned in these two passages. Now, uh, Mark or Bob, would you all like to make any brief reference to these scriptures and how they I outline the I want the Mark term? to, but before he does, I want to say something, but I want Mark to give an exposition of this because he can give it from a background of, uh, you might say, with the uh, oneness doctrine as the background of it and do it. But before we leave this idea of the uh, God is light and the color thing that I was talking about, uh, Larry, for years I have kind of made a uh, sideline or avocation of mine to study color and uh, some of its size psychological impacts upon men and uh, the color associations that human beings make and uh, various things. But I'm not doing that simply as a uh, uh, fleshly type motivation as such. It was inspired, so to speak, by the scripture that I study and think in terms of the significance of colors. And the scripture that got me going on this was Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11 where it refers to that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. If you look up that Greek word manifold, it means multi-tinted or many-tinted or, or word variegated. Now, have you ever been down to a paint store to pick out paint for your home or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, they'll have charts, and they'll show you all kinds of tints. And I don't know how many hundreds of tints there are classified in the, the paint world so that they actually manufacture a paint that you could buy, but I know there are multitudes of them. There are many, many, many tints. Well... The Bible says here that the wisdom of God is many-tinted or multi-tinted or variegated. Now, what is the wisdom of God? Well, the wisdom of God is everything that proceeds out from God. Mm -hmm. Now, how did he create this world? 
the word of his mouth, and the word of his mouth manifests the wisdom of his mind. And what do we see in this world? We see colors, don't we? Mm -hmm. We see green grass, we see blue skies, we see yellow sunshiny days, we see on and on and on. We could go describing the various tints and the shades of color. Everything we see, we see in a form that is colored. And where did this color come from? There is no way that you and I could invent a color. God invented them all. So everything that we see is a creation of God, right? Right. And it has a color, right? Mm -hmm. And it was created by God with this color, right? Mm -hmm. And everything that was created was created out of the mind of God. So what is this telling us? That the color principle that we have here, God is light. We, we see these things because of the light ray that falls on it. In effect, God is creating these colors by which we respond to things and react to things. And we're using color every day in our lives. Uh, we're wearing clothes of a certain color. We're trying to match up color. We buy a car of a certain color, a carpet for a home of a certain color, and, and so on and so on. And I don't want to get off on a long lecture on the color, but what I'm emphasizing is this truth, that this thing about color is not just some idle, human, carnal thing. Color is a creation of God. Light is a creation of God. And if God is light, this principle of dividing and observing him as colors is not something we can take all that lightly mm -hmm. just to say, well, this was something of man. This is something of God, my friend. Well, that's true. Well, now we're going to have to rush through here because we don't have that much time, and I've got a lot of charts, <laughs> so we're going to have to get into it. But uh, with that ex exposition of color, we see I've got some color here on this chart. And Mark, I'd like you to get into this a little bit. I know uh, from a little background in Greek that I have, uh, Granville Sharp's rule would come into play on some of these verses, particularly this one about the distinction of persons. Uh, would you like to make any expositions on this well, particular I'll passage? Well, I'll say first off that uh, these two passages you've given have been important in the history of uh, Christian thought, primarily because they pull together the terms that we're using here. It doesn't take someone with a high education to see when you read Matthew 28:19 that you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're talking a little while ago about the significance of three with regard to God, and it's quite apparent with a passage such as this, why aren't there any more mentioned here? And then when you study the uniqueness of these terms, you find that they are quite unique in relationship to God. And you see the similar thing in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. And of course, Granville Sharp's rule uh, the part that's uh, applied to this particular passage is when you have more than one noun that's joined together by the uh, Greek word chi or the conjunction chi, and yet each noun is preceded by the definite article, then that means that you are referring to more than one person. So you have the, the, right. the, and then you, you have the chi and. Right. If you just had, for instance, a good example would be uh, John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The word chi there joins together those two uh, nouns, but neither one of them is preceded by the definite article. So that means, or the word the, that means they could very well be referring to the same subject. But here you have, at very least, you have a definite uh, uh, attempt by the writer to stress the distinction between the subjects. He could have said in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and just put and joined them together with Kai. But instead he puts before each noun the definite article, which means he is wanting to make a statement about the distinctive nature of each. And I think that's the very least we can make of it. Now, Granville Sharp's rule is a controverted thing, but I think at least we can... Uh, uh, make that type of a statement with regard to that passage of Scripture. Very well said. And with time flying, I want to race through a lot of these charts very quickly so we can get to uh, some of the arguments set forth by some of these uh, anti-Trinitarian groups. Uh, basically, this is going to be kind of a quick rehash of some of the things you said in our first program, and so I won't linger on them very long. Uh, we have the Trinity revealed in the Old Testament in creation, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, Elohim, God made 
you know, the heavens and the earth. Uh, also Genesis 1:26, let us make man in our image. 27, Isaiah 44:24. 24. Uh, he, what's interesting here, it's not so much Trinitarian as you just find that it says, I stretched out the heavens by myself. But yet we see over here he's using these plural names and stuff, and over here you get myself. I, kind of I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to make a comment about Genesis 1, 26 and 27. I think mm -hmm. it's a significant point. The scripture says, God said, let us make man in our image. And the next verse says, and so God created man in his own image. You have it reverting from the plural to the singular. Mm -hmm. And you have the same thing in Isaiah 44, 24. When, it, when the singular appears, that means you're referring to the being of God, which there is right. none other than him. Uh, but when you see the plural, that means that that God is revealing something about himself internally. That's an excellent point. So I think that that is, can be seen. It can be seen very clearly in Genesis 126. Good point. Of course, we see again in at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, verses 6 through 8, uh, let us confuse their languages, things of this nature. Three distinct persons in Isaiah 48:16 says, Come near to me, listen to this. From the first I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Interesting way of uh, uh, talking if it's in a monothe monotheistic sense, but yet we have basically three different uh, egos or, or centers of consciousness or, or, or persons mentioned there. Uh, two distinct persons as Jehovah. We find that in Genesis 1924. Uh, Dr. Morey in a debate he had with David Bernard, he mentioned uh, Proverbs 30 verse 4 where uh, uh, I'll just let the viewers of the time uh, being short. I can't read all these passages, but uh, check out Proverbs 30, verse 4. I, didn't, I hadn't even realized that one was in there before. I'll uh, notice another one if I could. I, go ahead. I don't want to take all the time up, but another passage like that would be the psalm where it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, ah, sit on my right hand. And that's coming up in the thing, chart. Okay, the, significant, <laughs> the significant thing about that verse is Jesus used it to prove that he was greater than David. That's right. And and so that indicates that to be the Lord there is meaning that he's greater than a man, which would indicate his deity. And so you have deity speaking to deity. Exactly. That was uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. Right. All right. And then uh, the Hebrew uh, usage of Echad in uh, Deuteronomy 6 4, uh, basically showing that composite unity of the word. And, oh, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, but the word one there in the Hebrew is Echad, which has an idea of com composite unity, not just a singular one. They could have used other Greek Hebrew words. Uh, Larry, you've got all that uh, bracketed under Old Testament. Now, I, I know I'm digging into the New Testament to get this, but it refers you back to the Old Testament. You know the case of Melchizedek, mm -hmm. early in the book of Genesis? Mm -hmm. uh, he just comes out of nowhere. Abraham pays tithes to him. Now, Paul's commentary on that, or the writer of the book of Hebrews, if it was someone else other than Paul, some people seem to question, you know, well, Paul wrote that book. But in the seventh chapter, uh, Melchizedek is presented there as a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's said about him was he's without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life. Now, what he's affirming there is the deity the deity of uh, Christ, the, the Son of God, and uh, let me get it right here, without father, without mother, without descent, uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, it made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now, putting this idea of Trinity into the concept here, how did Paul, who wrote this, uh, how did he come up with this idea that Melchizedek was a type of Jesus Christ here, deity? If if they didn't have, as you've been pointing out in these scriptures, a concept of Trinity, you know, some people try to say, oh well, you know, the Trinity came. Well, they blame it on Tertullian. Is he the one that Nicaea? Council uh, who of Nicaea. Who was it? Used the word Trinity. First? Oh, Trinitas. That was Tertullian. Was that Tertullian? Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, anyway, they say he started this idea. But now what about here? He's saying that Melchizedek is a type of Christ who did not have any descent. He did not have any beginning of days. So you've got to give him the quality of deity. And Melchizedek, back in the Old Testament, is the type you know, that he's referring to. That's a good to. point. 
And of course, uh, we're going to bring up a chart here shortly that's going to get into a lot of the deity of Christ verses because this is critical to the whole doctrine of the Trinity. Moving on into the New Testament, we have a Christ incarnation in Luke 1. 35, the Holy Spirit uh, will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, uh, will be called the Son of God. You have all three members of the Trinity mentioned there at Christ's baptism, Matthew 3, 16, 17. This is where the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove and a voice out of heaven says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. You've got all three there again. In Christ's teachings, uh, this is on the teachings of the paraclete, the comforter who will come, the Holy Spirit. And constantly in these passages, for instance, and uh, Mark had brought these up in our first show in this series, John 14:26, 26, uh, John 15, 26, you have, you have things like it where it says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Constantly he's referring one to the other, the Father sent him. I'm, he's going to say that, you know, it's like you had three different people going on there. Uh, I also like what John 16, 13 says about uh, the Holy Spirit will only tell what he hears, <laughs> which is interesting uh, if, uh, you know, uh, if you think about that through about in this whole concept of the Trinity. Even, Ap- even one, one that's right that I read after on that particular passage said, uh, said, uh, it is giving us a conceptual distinction, but it's not a real distinction. So even a verse as strong as that has to even cause those type of people to say, yeah, there's a distinction, but we're not going to admit it's a real distinction. Right. They, uh, it's sort of like uh, what some groups say, well, this is a lesser form of worship, uh, mm-hmm. Latria versus uh, Dooley or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, that's in the, some other theology. Okay, moving on down, apostolic teaching. Uh, you've got all these references here, so if you're watching at home, then cameras zoomed in on it write these down I don't have time to go into all these but it just basically gives you uh, you know a mention of the, the the three members of the Godhead throughout by the Apostles and you had mentioned this once again your charts matching up pretty good with mine uh, in the first show about the Trinity raises Jesus from the dead Fa- the father raises Jesus in Acts uh, 326 in this other passage Jesus raises himself in John chapter 2 verses 19 through 21 the spirit raises Jesus in Romans 8 11 and God raises Christ in Acts 17:31. And then moving on from there, this is uh, an important. Uh, this is where a lot of battleground takes place with uh, oneness Pentecostals and uh, other groups that deny the Trinity. The distinct, you know, that there there are distinct persons in the Godhead. They're distinct from each other. Jesus is not the Father. The Holy Spirit's not the the Son, and so forth. Uh, one of the, my favorite passages in this in this regard is John 8. Verses 16 through 18, it says, For yet if I judge, my judgment is true. This is Jesus talking. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Getting that from Deuteronomy 17, 6. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Which is interesting because he's also referencing back to John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, this is pretty weird terminology if Jesus is the Father. And the Father, you know, if he's all just one. He's talking like there's different people here. And, and he even mentions a testimony of two men uh, to throw this, this distinction in here. And then, of course, you uh, brought out John 17:5, which had a tremendous impact on uh, your coming out of the oneness uh, theology. Uh, you can go to Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 9, which also uh, gets into some of these uh, these things, along with John 5, 23, Hebrews 1, verses 4, 6, and 9. Uh, moving down the page, we see Luke 3, 22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. That goes into that other passage we mentioned before from Matthew. And a, a voice came down from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and in thee I am well pleased. Once again, Holy Holy Ghost here, Jesus there, and God the Father there. Ephesians 2.18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Him, Christ. Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And unto the Father, God the Father. See also these other passages, John 1.1. 1, 1. And uh, y'all were mentioning, and Bob was bringing this up in a previous show also, John 10.30, uh, I and my Father are one. Well, actually, uh, the Greek word there uh, actually is Eisman, I guess, or Eastman. 
And uh, that means uh, we are. I and my Father, we are one. If you take it literally into the Greek, and the neuter word for uh, one, which is hen, is used implying essential unity, but not uh, personal unity. And you can compare that with John 17, verses uh, 21 through 23. So as I uh, give a rapid-fire uh, uh, presentation of these verses, because we've still got a lot of material to cover, I'm kind of running through here, but uh, this hopefully will give you a good basis. Uh, if you missed show number one, Mark went into a lot of these passages in, in some detail. Uh, I urge you to get a hold of that and, and see that too, since I don't have the time to expound on these like I would like. But now let's go to this one and ask the question, who is God? And this goes back into what you were saying before in the first show also, Mark. I've simply put more verses to it than you had in your charts. But the scriptures plainly teach there is one God. And then we've got plenty of verses to get into. You get into these Isaiah passages right through here, and over and over again, God says, there is no other God. I don't even know of any other gods. There is no God formed before me or after me, and, and so forth. You know, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, uh, there, though there be gods many and lords many, to us there's only one God, you know, and, and on and on the scriptures go. There's a lot more that can be listed on this chart besides what we have up here. This is just a sampling as a matter of fact, and of course, the Father is God. Plenty of verses, almost no one disagrees with that. Jesus is God. There are a lot more passages than even this listed here. I've got another chart that gets into this, so I won't elaborate at this moment. Uh, but going down, the Holy Spirit is God. And then there's plenty of passages that get into teaching that the, the Holy Spirit is not only personal, He's, a, he's mentioned as in personal pronouns throughout the scriptures, but uh, he, he is called Jehovah throughout, particularly in Acts 5. Uh, and what we get here is a deduction. We find in the scriptures the Father is God. We find in the scriptures Jesus is God. We find in the scriptures the Holy Spirit is God. Yet, we find in the scriptures there's only one God, leaving us to the conclusion that, well, if the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there's only one God, these three must be the one God, i.e. the Trinity. So, with that said, I'm going to move to the final part of our show here, and I'm going to let you guys get more into <laughs> the discussion. In fact, I think, uh, so I can uh, mix it up just a little bit here, I'm going to flip this chart to the other side and... Uh, <coughs> Well, actually, I'll, I'll just bring up Mark's chart here first so we can let, let him get into this some. Uh, Mark, we were talking about before that you've got the Trinitarian concept, but then you've got heresies on both sides of it, one to the one extreme and one to the other extreme. Now, you're coming from the United Pentecostal background, which denies the Trinity but says there's just one God in three different modes. So Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and su such as this. Now, these modalists, these people that believe this Baileyanism, uh, they have arguments that they like to bring up, attacking Trinitarian beliefs. Now, you have on your chart here mentioned some of these arguments, and I'd like you to run through them for our audience okay. just to help those that would like to know some good, you know, brief answers to be able to deal with these people when they run into them. Okay. A number of them I can think that we have already dealt with them, but uh, we'll run through them. Number one, the Bible teaches that there's only one God. The do this is the argument that they would use. The doctrine of the Trinity divides them into three gods. Of course, this is a fallacy because it assumes uh, its conclusion that you believe in three gods. And, and I will say that many of them actually do believe that Trinitarians affirm that there are three gods. Uh, they think that they'll actually say that. And so when they turn upon a scripture like Deuteronomy 6, 4 or other verses which proclaim Christ to be God, they, uh, or th there to be only one God, rather, uh, they think that they have already overthrown the doctrine of the Trinity by that, but that's not so. This violates the very statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, number two, Jesus claimed that when you see him, you're seeing the Father, John 14, 7 through 9. This means he was the Father. Now, this is a fallacy as well, because to claim that when you see him, you are seeing the Father is not equivalent to saying he was the Father. And, and I, I'll take another passage, like you can see several places where Jesus would say something like, he that receives you receives me. Uh, or something to that effect. It does not necessarily mean that they are the same person. And in this case, it's simply meaning that in Christ we see the attributes of the Father expressed in Him. This is really a claim to be co-equal with the Father more than the other. 
But uh, that is a good verse for the deity of Christ, but it is not a good verse for proving that Jesus is the Father in relationship to him as the Son. Then number three, Isaiah 9, 6 calls Jesus the Father. This is a verse that is oftentimes used. It call, says that his name will be called the Everlasting Father. Uh, now, the reply to this would be simply that um, uh, it does not say he's Father in relationship to the Son. It simply says he's the Everlasting Father, which can be uh, translated very easily the everlasting originator, or the originator of eternity. Uh, so that is a matter of looking at the Hebrew language a little more closely and finding out that it's not speaking about the father and son relationship in the New Testament, but a whole different subject. Also, just to jump in on that, it, uh, it could be translated father of eternity, meaning eternal. Right. And I'm just reading right out of uh, Bowman's uh, thing here. He says, compare other names formed with word father. And you have uh, Abalon, father of strength, and Second Samuel 23:31. And uh, he mentions many other ones in Exodus 6, 24, and, and uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. So I just want to throw that in as right. yeah, further backup for what you're good. saying. Yeah, that's very good. And, and, it, and it's borne out by an examination of the Hebrew word and how it's formed. Number four, who was the father of Jesus according to Luke 1, 35? This scripture says that the Holy Ghost would overshadow Mary and she would be found with child of the Holy Ghost. And from this it is claimed that uh, the Holy Ghost is the father of the Son. Uh, this is a fallacy as well because it does not even recognize that uh, Luke 135 is talking about the physical birth of Christ. The Trinitarian doctrine is talking about eternity past. This verse is simply affirming that the Holy Spirit uh, formed the womb, in the womb of Mary the body of Christ, and it does not refer to the eternal relationship of the Father and the Son, which is totally beyond the context of Luke 135. Number five, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are titles, not the name. Now, this is based on Matthew 28, 19, and it is a commonly used argument, even though uh, you may not think at first sight that it is a, a worthy argument. Uh, they consider it to have a lot of stock in it because in Matthew 29, say, 19, it says, Baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this has been dealt with two ways by Trinitarians. One is to say that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit do have the common name of God or Yahweh or the self-existent one. Or secondly, it's just a matter of grammar that you don't say baptize in the, the names of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit because that would indicate that we're trying to talk about all the names used for each one in all of Scripture, which is not what it's trying to say. And we could explain that more clearly if we had time, but that's just the basic idea of it. Number six, the doctrine of Trinity did not exist before its formulation at Nicaea. We've already shown that to be not true. Number seven, the terms used to describe the Trinity are not in the Bible, such as person, sub. We've already dealt with that as well. These terms are simply our attempt to express what the Bible is saying. And, uh, for instance, the word co-equal, I had a discussion with a man that denied the Trinity one time, and he said the word co-equal is not in the Bible. And I said, well, Philippians 2 said that who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He said, well, it's not the word co-equal. I said, what does the prefix co mean? It means with. And the scripture says he was equal with God. And so this term is simply stating what the scriptures say in a concise term. That way we don't have to explain everything over and over every time we say it. When I say that we believe in the Trinity, you know we're talking about what we've been talking about for the last two or three hours here. Uh, so it's just an easy way to refer to uh, what the scriptures teach. Number eight, the Trinity is confusing and mysterious and therefore impractical. This is, uh, from our perspective, a worthless argument because uh, it denies or it does not understand that everything we talk about when we talk about God has an element of mystery to it to our minds because we are finite and limited and God is infinite. And therefore, we can only know in a limited way what is true infinitely or unlimited in, in nature with regard to God. Then number nine, John saw only one throne in heaven, not three persons. This one's constantly used. This is a faulty argument as well. Because it assumes that there are going to, that the doctrine of the Trinity states that there are three visible forms that are limited as we are. God is an infinite, omnipresent spirit. But in addition to that, I could say that there are indications in the book of Revelation itself of the doctrine of the Trinity. For instance, Jesus said he would sit with his Father in his throne. Or in, I think it's chapter 4, the scripture says that the Lamb of God steps up and takes the book out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. And then as the chapter proceeds, both the Lamb of God and the one sitting upon the throne are worshipped, which indicates that both are God. 
and the distinction is maintained there. So that type of an argument really does not uh, answer or, or uh, affect the doctrine of the Trinity in any significant way. And number 10, is Jesus in the Godhead or the Godhead in Jesus? This is a very commonly asked question. It's actually the title of one of the booklets that they've put out that's been very popular through the years. And this type of question, again, is a fallacy. It, it is giving us an either-or situation. Either this is true or that is true. Uh, the word Godhead simply means God or deity. And so the question is, is Jesus in the Godhead? Or we could state that, is Jesus God? Yes, Jesus is God. Or is the Godhead in Jesus? Is deity in Christ? Yes, deity is in Christ, according to Colossians 2.9. So we would answer this question by saying, yes, if you correctly understand it, both statements are true. So those are just some common arguments that are used. They basically fall on fallacies such as this first one, claiming that Trinitarians deny that the monotheistic concept of the Bible, that's not true, and that disposes them of most of their uh, positive argumentation that they use. The rest of the time they spend explaining away passages that would imply the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, that was a good, brief, concise uh, refutation of uh, some of their standard arguments, and I think uh, the Lord will use this to help many people in dealing with uh, these arguments they're for sure going to run into down the line. Now, that's taking it from one extreme, one of the heresies that's common in attacking the Trinity on one side of it. Now, what I've got here is a chart. With the remaining time, I'll try to get as much as I can in, in the time remaining. Uh, this comes from the other side, from the Arians, the ones that, uh, uh, you know, don't even believe in the modes and stuff. They just deny the deity of Christ. They, uh, you know, they say basically there's just one God. Uh, but they, they don't even consider the, the modalism and the spalianism coming from the other extreme. And I'll answer, uh, I'll go through this chart uh, and see what we can come up with. Basically, these are common arguments by Arians, uh, basically like Jehovah's Witnesses, the Way International. Uh, there's other groups that fall on this line, uh, cults and, and whatnot, and they use these standard arguments. Some of these will match up with the ones uh, Mark just went over, because a lot of times the people that attack the Trinity use the same arguments, even if they have extremely different theologies. <laughs> They're just united on attacking the, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. And basically, as you see, point one, the Trinity is beyond human reasoning. Uh, this, we've talked about this before in, in shows. Basically, it goes back to Isaiah 55, which Bob brought up earlier, uh, 8 through 9. Uh, God's ways are higher than our ways. Uh, you, once again, you have the idea of uh, the infinite and the finite, our finite minds trying to understand an infinite God, it just doesn't work. If I knew all there was to know about God, I would be God myself. And it's as simple as that. So this argument is ridiculous right on its face. Okay, the next uh, argument that you'll hear a lot from Arians is uh, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Uh, Mark just brought that up a minute ago. Uh, but there's a lot of arguments. Uh, just because the word Trinity is not in the Bible, it's simply a, a theological term used to describe something of a doctrine that is in the Bible. Uh, I would ask Jehovah's Witnesses who usually use this, is the word uh, Bible in the Bible? <laughs> they use the word Bible all the time, uh, or, the uh, or Kingdom Hall. That's not in the Bible, or theoc uh, theocratic uh, organization, or circuit servant. None of these things are in the Bible, but the Jehovah's Witnesses use them, but yet they turn around and use this against Trinitarians. It doesn't work. Point three, the concept of the Trinity is confusing. Now, Mark just uh, brought that up a minute ago. Now, in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 12, it says, for we see through a glass darkly, uh, but then face to face. Once again, uh, there's just things we don't see clearly. Or uh, I mean, uh, it's once again the same old thing about the infinite, with the finite trying to understand the infinite. Uh, I don't understand all there is about electricity or nuclear fission, but I know it works. Uh, and so this, this argument, though, uh, one thing I do know is that that, that argument doesn't work. Okay, then part four, uh, number four, the Trinity was started at the Council of Nicaea in 325. That's standard. We've already reviewed that through church history. Point five, uh, pagan religions, Babylon and Syria, had uh, triads of gods. The Trinity came from these. And uh, as we've talked about, Bob went into some detail on this in a previous broadcast. Uh, it's basically a post hoc fallacy. Uh, we also know that the Babylonians and Assyrians believed in the flood, resurrection, things like this. The Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth wouldn't deny the resurrection just because some pagans believed it before. It's just uh, it's an argument that doesn't follow. They're really depending on ignorance of people to, to buy that line. Okay, number six, if God and Trinity mean the same thing, how about John 1.1? 1, 1? It's that old argument where, well, if God is a Trinity, then you can put, wherever you see the word God in the Bible, you can put it in Trinity. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Trinity, and the Trinity 
was with the Trinity, and the Trinity was the Trinity. You know, and they're trying to trip you up, but we all know from our long expositions that not every time do you see in the Bible where it says God, is it specifically talking about maybe the Trinity? It might be talking about God, uh, who is the Son, or I'd God. I'd also like to say on John 1, 1, and that argument is used also by oneness people, uh, the Greek text there actually makes a distinction between the one the Word was with and the one the Word was. It says, and the Word was with God. The Greek says, prostan theon. Mm -hmm. It has the definite article before God. But in the latter part of the verse, it says, kai theos ein halagos. It doesn't have the definite article yeah, before God. Yeah, it's an anthrous. It's an anthrous. An right. It, right. So what it's saying, what it's actually saying there, without the article, it would be stressing the nature of the subject. With the article, it's stressing a particular person. And so in John 1, 1, it would be saying the Word was with the God, identifying the specific person of the Father, as is the general custom of the Greek New Testament to put the definite article before God when it is signifying the Father. And then the latter part is wanting to stress that the Word was not only with God, but He was God by His very nature, which is what it's stressing there. But the Greek text does make a distinction between the one was Word and the That's true. With. Now, with time rapidly uh, disappearing on us, I will continue to go through this chart. Number seven, Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord is one, not three. You hear that a lot from these uh, heretics. But we've already talked about it before, about the, the word echad uh, and the word, uh, you know, uh, there for one is really a composite unity. You get that with the, the spies that went into the, whole, the, the promised land with the, the grape, the grapes and Adam and Eve with the, the one flesh and things of this nature. Okay, point eight, Christ must be one-third God. And Mark, you just answered that a while ago on your chart. It kind of reminds me of uh, asking the question, well, you've got space, which has height, depth, and uh, distance, let's say. Now, try to cut that three ways. It just doesn't work. It's sort of like trying to cut a beam of light, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, now to finish this off and then wrap the show up, uh, we've got point nine here, and this is your key thing. This ties right back into what Bob started the show off with. Uh, the Bible does not say Jesus is God. Uh, see verses such as Revelation 3.14, Colossians 1.15, John 14.28, John 3.16, etc. Also Proverbs 8.22. They use a place like he's the beginning of the creation of God. He's the firstborn of God. My father is greater than I. Uh, the monogenes, the only begotten son. Uh, and he's uh, created wisdom here. Now all these verses that Jehovah's Witnesses and other her heretics use can be easily refuted. And so uh, uh, we don't have time in this particular broadcast to go through, but if they will write Pilgrim Publications, uh, these can be uh, refuted in detail from the Greek and from the Biblical Scriptures. Uh, but to finish off now and close down the show, uh, to refute these arguments and others, we want to say that Jesus is God, the Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. In the Old Testament, you have these, these uh, descriptions of God, the Y-H-W-H, -H, Jehovah, and uh, Descriptive terms of God in the Old Testament here are Creator, Savior, God, I Am, First and Last, Rock, Light, Judge. There's many others that could be used. Uh, but in the New Testament, we find these titles here, which are given to Jehovah of the Old Testament. They are, they are in turn given to Jesus Christ in the New Testament, according to these, these scriptures right here. Well, with that... Uh, we're out of time. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're, we're signing off now. Uh, if you have any further questions on uh, these or other matters, please write us. The phone number and telephone, uh, the phone number and the uh, mailing address will come up at the end of the show. I'm Larry Wessels for Bob L. Ross and Mark McNeil. Thank you for joining us in this special broadcast. God bless. Please contact Christian Answers for free information on numerous subjects important subjects such as the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Free newsletters are available on the heretical position held by many unbiblical cults such as Jehovah's Witnesses and the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Free newsletters are available on strange groups such as the King James Onlyites. To receive your free information please call 512-218-8022 or email us at cdebater at aol.com. To see full-length videos on these and other subjects, go to Yahoo Video, type Larry Wessels into the search box, and click on the icon for iShoot Video or iShoot Video 2.